Amen. Amen. Well, you know, um, I don't know if somebody's going to come and say we've done something wrong here. Um, because Alex had to draw the symbols because they were so... Um, uh, they were poor quality. And um, I'm going to take you on a journey. It is about the end times. And uh, it is about this perfect language that's going to be spoken once the Jews are reconciled to the Messiah. And I'm going to just show you through the Word of God tonight how this language is seen. And, um, but when we were um, singing that song as well... Uh, re reading the psalm, sorry. If you just turn for one moment, please, to Psalm 34 for a moment. Um, the Lord it has not got many scholars here. He has not got many clever people here. But he's got people with a mouth. He's got people with a heart. He's got people with a voice. It isn't going to matter that we're not intellectual, but it is going to matter. Or whether whether we make our heart the home for the Holy Spirit, that he can come and minister to us at any moment of our lives. And I've been looking today at the, um, the Hebrew language, 22 letters. I don't know it. And this psalm, Psalm 34, has 22 letters. It has got the whole alphabet through it. But I want to show you something now. The first verse, of course, one is Aleph, two is Bet, three is Gimel, four is Dalet. I'm going to leave you to do that at home because we're doing loads of this tonight. But I just want to show you, I am a simple person who got saved 33 years ago. And tonight, I'm looking here at Psalm 34, and I've written next to it a symbol. Verse 17. And 17 is pay or however you pronounce it. And pay is the mouth. And I'm looking at this, and I'm reading it with you. The righteous use their mouth, and they cry, and the Lord hears, and he delivers them out of all their troubles. And I go, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're just loving me, Father. You're just revealing to me very simple truths, and I am in love. So, we're, I'm going to show you how we're starting tomorrow with the ladies. Proverbs 31 is called an acrostic poem. This is called an acrostic poem. It means that God is expressing the truth and he needs the whole alphabet to express it. And I'm going to show you some of the other Psalms. But isn't it lovely tonight? It starts with Aleph, the ox, the strength, the leader. He is our beast of burden. He is the oxen in Leviticus that had to be ripped apart, that had to have his skin taken off, that had to have all his insides exposed. And if you hadn't got an ox and you just got a little bird, you had to twist the neck and pull the feathers off. That the, that the, sorry? So that the sun, it was showing you that Jesus would be stripped naked on the cross in the centre of the world, and he would have no place. Everything about him would be exposed. He was pulled apart. His skin was flayed. His, everything about him, he became the perfect sacrifice for each one of us. And that's why we're here. That's why we're faithful. That's why we're the remnants. And it finishes, of course, with the tav, which is the cross. Hallelujah. Which is the mark, the sign, the covenant, and the signature. Everything finishes at the cross. So I'm, I'm here, I am, not an intellect. I'm going to Psalm 34, and I'm now looking at the 21st verse. What does the cross bring? Have a look. See, this is how I'm reading it. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those, because of the tav, the cross, who take refuge in him, will be condemned. Has anybody got a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Because you can go tonight. Alex done you all these sheets for you to take home tonight. You can sit there and the first thing you can do is put... Alison's already done it because she's a desperate woman who needs Christ. I'm a desperate woman. Some of us barren women, all we've got. Would you agree? Broken hearts. Broken hearts. Utterly broken, barren, useless, we feel in ourselves. And this word comes. 
and he begins, he begins to minister himself to us. And he's, my father has ministered to me already and said that word of truth will not be taken out of your mouth. That young man was born in Romania and the last time you got it, he wasn't even alive in his mother's womb. But I knew then you'll hear this word again, Julie. But it'll be 26 years on. A complete stranger from this country will read it out again. Not planned, not arranged, but a father in heaven. So we're saying in Psalm, in, in uh, Psalm 34, verse 17, the word, the reference is pay, and the pay here is the mouth. Okay, you can see where it says mouth, word, speak. And what are we meant to do with it? What are we meant to do with it? The righteous use the mouth and they cry, and the Lord hears. And what does he do when he's heard our cry? He delivers them out of all their troubles by faith. I'm living by faith. I'm here tonight by faith, and so are you. And then right at the end, if you just look at it, verse 22, the last symbol is the cross, the tav. You know, go through Ezekiel 9, put a mark on the foreheads. It was a mark of the tau, the cross. Verse 22, so we've got a cross, and the, only the cross can bring redemption. Would you agree? Yes. And what do we read here? The Lord redeems with the tav the soul of his servants and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And what we're going to show you is how marvellous these, there are several acrostic poems in the Bible that bear the whole 22 letters. Now I know some of you know what they are. We're going to go on a journey and look at them. And I don't know about you, it is wonderful and it is exciting. Just turn with me please to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Is the world getting better? Are the problems getting easier? No, I feel like my brain is frying. Do you feel like your brain is frying? Lots of things going on all around you. You've got to keep coming back to the Lord. Right. <laughs> you know, let's just turn to verse 14, please. And this is, this is lovely. Um, and I, I, I need a perfect saviour, and I've been given one, and so have you. And this is what we need to remember. Verse 14. For he knows, for he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. But do you know what that word frame means in the Hebrew? It means squeezing into shape. You should be struggling. I should be struggling. Because of those big, marvelous hands of God. And he's fashioning me for his kingdom. And to do it, he's got to squeeze. He's got to fashion. He has got to shape. Now, I must just say, sometimes I get some real miserable looks when I'm up here at the front. And I, I, I have a question. Sorry? You're smiling, yeah. None of us, none of us should be anything but full of joy tonight. Because we've had a divine exchange. Isn't that true? But when I look at this, the word here, for he himself knows our frame, means he himself knows our squeezing into shape. It means a verb meaning to fashion, to shape, to devise, to cut, and to frame. He's got some adjusting to make on me. Isn't that right? I need some adjusting. Who's doing the adjusting? The Lord is doing the adjusting. And he's got, you know when you've got this wonderful picture and you just want to fold it all together, you want to put a limit around it, like this wonderful thing that Lou, I'm going to bring that in in a minute, Lou, that Lou has made me, you want to put a frame around it to, to just keep it so as perfect as it is. You just want to frame it. But before he finishes framing us, he's got to squeeze us. We are the clay and he is the potter. And a potter once came to speak many years ago and he says, I do clay. He says, do you want to know where you get the clay from? You get it from a very smelly hole in the ground. And he says, and when you put your hand in, he says, the smell of this, the clay to mould is revolting. He says, see yourself like that. And then he starts to shape you. He starts to mould you. He starts to fashion you for himself. He's squeezing you. He's squeezing us into shape. And it hurts, doesn't it? If you are squeezed, it hurts, doesn't it? We're here tonight, and some of us are hurting. And we, 
just by looking at these wonderful words at the moment, we're going to carry on just a moment, but then I just want you to go to Psalm 37. Are you being squeezed into shape? Yes. Whose shape? His shape. Not anybody else's shape. You know, we've got plenty of knockers, plenty of people who keep finding fault with us every day. You know, Jesus had someone who walked with him for, for three years and then he betrayed him with a kiss. Now, some would say you should have had more discernment. They would, wouldn't they? In our age that thinks we could psychologically sort every issue out, Jesus should have, should, should have discerned that Judas was a betrayer. He knew that Judas was a betrayer. You know, that there's no easy answer to the Christian war. We have got to live it, and we've got to draw strength from the helper that's come. But he says, I know your frame is weak. I'm squeezing you into shape. But you are a poor man. What do we do with our mouth? We cry to the Lord. And what does the Lord do? He answers us and delivers us from all our troubles. I need his help today. You need his help today. We need his help today, don't we? Now, have a look at this. Psalm 37, verse 37. Mark the blameless man. Who is he? Christ. And behold the upright. For the man of peace will have a posterity, an end, a future. Look at your margin there. Look at your margin. It actually says, mark the complete man. Who's that? Jesus, sent from heaven to come to earth to die for us and defeat um, the enemy in the grave. Grave couldn't hold him to come back and to impart to his people the message of the sending of the Holy Spirit. Now, so we've got mark the complete man, mark the perfect man, and then it says, but in the Hebrew it actually means this, and I need this tonight. Mark the gentleman. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, I've got to look you know, to Jesus. And I've got to mark him. What does mark mean? I've got to watch him. I've got to watch what Jesus does. I've got to watch how he responds. I've got to watch how he thinks. Now, I've had situations this week where I could have not marked the perfect man. I could have, I could have said something. I could have made things worse. I marked the gentleman. I looked at him. I watched him in the word. I'm going to do that. I've ice caught me safe this far. I'm going to carry on. I'm going to hold my peace. I'm going to mark the perfect man. Does that touch your heart tonight? Pardon? Oh, Alison, my sister. She's my younger sister, Helena. And she's, I've always done that. Isn't that nice? But mark the gentleman. Mark, it says, the dear man. Do you know in the Hebrew he says, mark the dear man? Is he dear to you? He's dear to me. Is he blameless to you? Yes. Is he gentle to you? Yes. It means mark the gentle, the dear man, the complete man, the perfect man. Behold the upright, for the man of peace will have a posterity or will have a future. And let's just turn before we start to Isaiah 53, verse 1. A friend of mine, a very posh gentleman, said to me, the trouble is for you, Julie, you don't get in the front room quick enough. You take us through too many rooms before you arrive at the subject. But I would say every word of God is living, isn't it, and active. I believe I've had a word given me even tonight, obscure to some, but meaning everything to me. Those words of truth will not be taken out of your mouth. But you know, this is it, Isaiah 53, uh, verse 1. And we're looking at this a bit more tomorrow, ladies. This is the pleading of the remnant, the suffering servant. This is where Israel are going to plead before they're converted. And it says this, Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed now I would say to you and to me the arm of the Lord or who has believed his report well I have believed the report I believe that God sent his son to die in the center of the the world that his son created every atom of it and allowed himself to be butchered and beaten, did not sneer, did nothing to those who were sneering at him. I believe the report of God, that God sent his son to find this dirty old clay in the ground and take her out. Am I surprised he's having to squeeze me into shape? I didn't come out the ground beautiful. Nothing in us merited him leaving heaven. Nothing. Jesus came for his father. The father sent his son 
for us. We weren't lovely, we aren't lovely, but in Christ, he sees us already. Finished work, beautiful. We're just, he's, yes, he's gentle with us, he's molding us, he's shaping us, he's fashioning us, and he's framing us. He's going to finish this work off. We're for all called home in the rapture pretty soon. That's the framing day. That's the day somebody walked into that room 20 odd years ago, walked in to 100 people, looked at me and said, you're already wearing the sisters. Sister, you're already wearing the soul winner's crown. It's already on your head. What a lovely thing to have said. I've already got the soul winner's crown on my head. He'd come from, I didn't know him, I'd never seen him before in my life. Walked straight over and stood before me and said, look at her, everybody. She's already got it on her head. Oh, hallelujah. We're living for the future. Mark the perfect man. Mark the complete man. Mark the gentleman. Mark the upright man. Whose report have we heard? We have heard the report of the Lord. And then, uh, this is where we're going to start now. We're going to go you, to do Samuel chapter 8. Do you like to know where it starts? Yes. Oh, I do. Because I was in my daily Bible reading. Hence, all this has come from this one particular thing, okay? I do not find it difficult to witness to anybody about Christ because I have got nothing else. And he is my love. He's my life. He's my only reason to stay upon this earth. And it looks like we're being given another day today. Some of you have got more than us in the natural. Some of us have more of Jesus, you know. Um, it's more room. We have to make more room for Jesus every day. But when you get to 2 Samuel chapter 8, the heading is called David's Triumphs. And a couple of weeks ago, Alec did a Bible study on 22, the number 22. And... There are, we know, 22 things were created in the six days of creation. 22, um, I've got to put these glasses on, um, Lord, forgive me. 22 generations from Adam to Jacob. Now, if I'm going to convince somebody I can drive that car, what have I got to do? I've got to get in it, put the engine on. I've got to drive away. I've got to show this thing works. So I want to go to a mechanic to keep it going. I, I love the word, and every day in my particular life, the word of God comes to me fresh. The number 22 means light oh, making Lord. manifest. Agreed? Yes. A wonderful number. Carol lives there. It was Alex's home before. And Alec did, and he says, in the six days of creation, 22 different things were created. Like, like when you say birds, it's not one bird. It would be in the cycle of birds, you know, but 22. 22 generations from Adam to no, Jacob. Careful. Well, what does that mean? 22 generations from Adam to Jacob. Jacob is Israel. Now, there lies, I think, a wonderful lesson. And we'll see. I get to David here, and David, now read this with me, please, the first five verses. Now, this is called David's triumphs. Now, after this, it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. David took control of the chief city from the hand of the Philistines, and he defeated Moab, and he measured them with the line, making them lie down on the ground, and he measured two lines to put to death. One full line to keep alive, and the Moabites became servants to David, bringing tribute. This is David ri rising and going forth to conquer. Verse 3, then David defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rahab, king of Zobar, as he went to restore his rule at the river. Now, if you've read brethren writers like me, when I read at the river... The river is talking about the river flowing from the temple in the, new, in, uh, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. We've got a king who restores at the river. What do you think? Amen. Lydia found a king who restored her at the We're going there in a few weeks. We're going to sit where they believe she was. She was restored at the river. She went out to pray by the river. 
And I'm beginning to think, this is wonderful. But it's really early one morning. Good. David captured from him 1,000, I don't like this bit, seven, 1,007, 1,700 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers, and David hamstrung the chariot horses, but reserved enough of them for 100 chariots. I don't like to think, Father, of a horse being hamstrung. And I'm going to be honest with you now. When I read the Bible, I stop at everything. And I ask God, do you? I don't want to think of the horses hamstrung. I don't want to think of the people dying. And God doesn't either. We have to know that. That Jesus Christ um, causes us to love our enemies to, and to be kind to our animals. This is a completely different thing. So we'll move on from that. But these are questions I come back to with the Lord. Now, verse 5, and this is the verse. And when the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadiza, king of Zobar, David killed 22,000 Arameans. Are you all right, Sharon? Yeah. Oh, are you all right? Have you finished work? Yeah. You look wonderful. Are you limping? I've been doing some killing, but it's all right. Oh, yeah, she's here. Well done. What do you think? What do you think? You've done the Bible study on the Tuesday, Wednesday morning, first thing, really early. I'm finding then the kingdom of David, he's, he's actually killed 22,000. Yeah. Moses had 22,000 Levites consecrated to serve the tabernacle. Now, so what I'm thinking is, oh Lord, please show me now. As you carry on, this is David. Um, he look, he goes, he puts garrisons in verse 6. And then you go down, look to verse 14. He put garrisons in Edom. In all Edom he put garrisons and all the Edomites became servants to David. Think of the last battle. And the Lord helped David wherever he went. Here it is. David reigned over all Israel. Is Jesus going to reign all over Israel? And what did David do? Administer justice and righteousness for all his people. This is a type of the second coming of Christ. But why has he got the 22,000? Because 22 is the number of God's perfect, <coughs> pardon me, communication and language. And it rests from the generations from Adam to Jacob, which I'll show you tonight. Verse 16, Joab the son of Zeruah was over the army. Jehoshaphat the son of Ahihud was recorder. Zadok the son of Ahitub and Ahimelech the son of Abiathar were priests. <coughs> and Sarai was secretary, and here it is. Benaiah, the son of Jehodiah, was over the Kerethites. Okay. And the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers. So we've got a king rising up to go forth and conquer. And he actually kills 22,000. Then he's coming to the city to administer justice. Amen. It has to be Christ Amen. taking up his reign. Amen. Then I looked at the word Kerethites and it means... Executioners. Executioners. The dappled horse riders. The grizzled horses. The ones after Jesus has come. Lovely. Wonderful. He's setting his kingdom up and the first thing he has to do is deal with every enemy of Israel. When he lands in Jerusalem, he's still got people to deal with. Yeah, well done, executioners. And then he's got Pelethites, his runners. Runners, executioners, and runners. Right, just turn with me, please, to Esther for a moment. Now, by this time, I'm bouncing around upstairs, very happy. Fresh as a daisy. Give a new strength for the day. I don't understand it any more than you do. But I see in it the coming of the Lord Jesus. I see in it a perfect order in the Scripture. And I see in it one who says, I will execute all those who tonight are going to be making agreements to come down. And they will come down. And they will try to push Israel into the sea. And Israel won't have a single nation to stand with them. We are living in the days to see Israel go, uh, America go anti-Israel. We've seen it, haven't we? We've seen it. We've seen it this week. 
And we've got somebody from this country saying, I, I completely understand how you feel about them wanting to annihilate you. To a Jewish prime minister, who they're saying is too big for his boots. He's coming from a nation that have been scattered by God. And in Isaiah 18, it says, and they'll be scattered and peeled before he comes. He says they'll literally be scattered and peeled before he comes. And sometimes, no matter what my issue is or your issue, we've been chosen to live. What a fantastic evangelism tool. What's happening out is because we're seeing God draw them. And David, you see, went out and killed 22,000. Why not 21,000, Lou? Why not 45? Because 22 has a perfect number. Amen. Yeah. There's 22 numbers in the Hebrew alphabet that can give a pure expression of God. 22,000 people were called by God to serve Moses and the tabernacle. 22 generations, not from Adam to Abraham, from Adam to Israel. 22,000. That's what this is all about, and it's the whole weekend. And it's just marvellous. I think it's marvellous. And Esther, chapter, uh, here we go, nine. I'm the only one who did a conference on Esther and only got to the end of chapter one. And yet I was meant to do the, every chapter because I'm finding everything so wonderful, okay? Yes, I'm sure you remember it. Who took letters? Who were the runners? Verse 30, 29, Queen Esther daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. Remember the two letters? The first one had the death, the second one had the life. And he sent letters, runners, to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Hasserus, namely words of what? Peace and truth. What are the Pelethites taking? What are the Pelethites taking? The executioners are the Kerathites. There's some going out and killing the enemies of Israel. And there's others going who are coming and they're going to bring those, the godly, Gentile, the remnant, the Gentile remnant who've been good to the Jews for three years. They're going to receive the good news. Now come to the nation. Come because the Jews are going to be in a position to bless you. They've been persecuted. Their tribulation has come. Song of Solomon chapter 1, they're burnt no longer. He's appeared for them. He's showing them the trail of the flock. Do you think there's something there? Do you think there's something there? David kills 22,000. He sets a line up and, uh, and then he restores at the river. You see, while all this is going on, the new temple is arising in Ezekiel 41. And in Ezekiel 47, the, the water's beginning to flow from underneath the threshold of the new temple for a thousand years. He's got to go and let the people know it's time to come. The Gentiles that have helped the Jew, the judgment of the sheep and goat nations, they're coming in. I reckon these are the runners. Do you? Do you think these could be the runners? Okay, I've moved me page. Pardon? On the, and the horses. Oh, yes. You see, should we just turn the page over for a moment, please? Now, King, let's go to... Um, Mordecai's greatness in Esther, Esther 10 is after the letters have gone out. Mordecai's greatness here, everyone will tell you, this is the second coming of the Messiah. Mordecai is a type of Christ now. That's why he's the son of Abihail, the Jew. And it's the millennial reign. The king, now King Ahasuerus, laid a tribute on the land and on the coastlands of the sea. That's the nations. And all the accomplishments of his authority and strength. And the full account of who? The greatness of who? Mordecai. Who's Mordecai? He's a type of the Christ. He's a type of the second coming of the Christ for which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was who? Second. Everything is accomplished on the order of the second man. The first madam, man is of Adam. The second man is Christ of the Spirit. The second person of the Trinity is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Gideon had to give the second bullock. The second bull should have been three years. They let it live till seven. They're showing that the bullock is vital for the seven years of the tribulation. Okay, Mordecai the Jew is second only to King Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and in favor with the multitude of his kinsmen, one who sought 
This is the millennial reign of Christ. What does he say? One who sought the good of his people and one who spoke for the welfare of his whole nation. The Gentiles are going to come in to the blessing of the Jew and the letters are going to go out to bring them in. So let's just go back because let's just go back to 2 Samuel chapter 8, please. Now, so could you say here that there's a triumph and in verse 3, where does the king restore his rule? Where does he restore his rule? At the river. At the river. We just sang it, haven't we, in that song that you, there is a river whose streams shall make glad. The si- I can't sing. The city of our God, but I've got a heart to sing. There is a river. There is a river whose streams shall make glad. The city of our God. And we are going to be there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Bill Randall's great of the night could say, cheer up what he said cheer up and don't just be happy three days of the week try it for four five six seven every day cheer up my marriage went no good my life's gone not a lot of good but I'm looking at the king who's going to restore his rule at the river and he says I've got that river of life flowing out of me what we're looking at tomorrow ladies Jesus was not angry with the lady at the well that she'd had five husbands because all she'd had was the law and he says, and the man you're with not now is not your husband. He met him. Wow. The man you're with now is not your husband yet. Not until you ask for living water. Then I shall be your husband. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, how merciful. You've only had the law, he says to the Jews. He finds her at Sychar. He finds her at the well that means drunkenness. But it means another thing in the Hebrew. It means purchased. He purchases drunks. Wow. What do you say? Hallelujah. I'm not annoyed with you, lady. You've had five, five husbands, five books of the law. You've had the Torah. And he that speaks to you, and this one is not your husband yet, but by the time you've finished, I'm tired, I'm weary, and I'm revealing to the world, to a woman that nobody else would want to be sitting with, a dirty Samaritan, I will be your husband. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, she did. Oh, she did because she... You see, those who have been forgiven much... They love much. There are some people here who've had a nice life. I can't imagine what that's like. But sometimes, sometimes the Lord says, those who've been forgiven much, they love even more because they're so grateful. They're so grateful. And then some of us have only got him. And some of us need, all of us need him, don't we? Doesn't he get lovelier through the word? Doesn't he get lovelier through the word? Anyway, meanwhile, back at the ranch, they used to say, the ranch of Zion, where the water's flowing, thousand years, did you hear that, devil? The water the king will restore his people at the river. And he's going to deal with every enemy of Israel, 22,000. He's going to deal with the enemy of Israel. And then he's going to send out the Kerethites, the executioners, you who have a plan against the nation of Israel. He won't give him any joy, I'm sure, but they will be cut down. And then the runners, isn't it lovely that the executioners go out before the runners? By the time the runners get there, it says there'll be no no evidence of a nuclear war. Who says there's going to be one? But they provide, they're getting ready. So what I'm saying is we're not saying there's going to be a nuclear warhead. People used to say that. You know, they used to, I used to think, well, what would be the point, Lord, in surviving a thermonuclear winter for seven years and finally coming up from the tunnel? There isn't a bird. There isn't a tree. There isn't anybody in the world that survived. If they did, they'd have five heads and malfunctioning. Think about it. And people go along and say God's judgment in Joel is a nuclear warhead. But we don't know that. Well, we don't know what we're reading today, but we believe the Spirit of God is revealing something to us. Is that right? And we catch it tonight in the Spirit. We catch it tonight in the Spirit. Because it's a perfect order. So I've put by verse 15. Should we read it together again? 2 Samuel, we've gone back. 2 Samuel 8, verse 15. We haven't even touched the uh, alphabet yet. David reigned over how much of Israel? And David administered what? Justice. Put your bombs away. Saudi Arabia, isn't it? You know, bank rolling, the intifada. You imagine what's going to go on. Imagine. And we've been chosen to shine in a very dark world. And if it's 
very dark, you only need one match to give some light. So that's what the Lord... And he's saying, as you go and you give... You believe my report. And that's, he's saying, mark me. Don't mark anybody else in church. Don't look for somebody else. Mark me. Follow me. Mark me. Track me. Keep looking where I am. Keep looking where I'm moving. Keep looking where I'm going. Because we'll, we'll see in a minute. And then he says, and righteousness for all his people. And I have put there Isaiah chapter 11. The knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The lions will be vegetarians. Then he says, I've got you to come. And that's when in verse 18, he sends out the Kerethites and the Pelethites. How do you know the runners are successful? Well, you've read this before. 2 Samuel chapter 9. David's kindness to Mephibosheth. Who can tell me what Mephibosheth means in Hebrew? It means, well done folks, you know it. Destroying shame. Destroying shame. Fancy having Jonathan, Jonathan, who David loved, had a son, and he called him Destroying Shame. And the reason he called him Destroying Shame, because he fell. If you read the story, I'm sure that you know it, he fell. David wanted to give ministry to this young man who the nurse had dropped him. And he'd been damaged in the fall. You were destroying shame. I was destroying shame. I was damaged in the fall. And I needed a good king to come and get me. I needed someone to find me in Lodabar. And you can tell me what Lodabar means. No pasture. No pasture. Low, have you got that, Rodney? Did you say low pas no pasture? Yeah. No word, yes, but it actually means, doesn't it, in the Hebrew, no pasture as well. That's what, so word, pasture, no word, load of barn, no place. So this is a picture here. David's kindness is shown to um, Jonathan's son. So David is in his position of authority, and what does he do? He shows kindness to people and brings them in to the millennial reign. Now, the kindness he shows is how have you taken care of the Jewish people during the seven-year tribulation? Does that make sense? Amen. Absolutely wonderful. So he says, isn't he, there's a house, I, I am your servant. And so he says, he shows they must, um, the, they, good grief. Uh, <clears throat> he doesn't show the kindness to the people until he set the kingdom up in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, he goes and fetches all those that were damaged by the fall, but that were kind to the nation of Israel. The shepherd has gone to get those who are in no pasture to bring them to pasture. Is that wonderful? Are you saying this is the best thing I've ever read? This word of God is living inside of me. Okay. It has, it has power to make you clean, vid, doesn't it? It has power to make you clean. Okay, so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to turn without further ado to Psalm 111. 22. Those who fell can only be restored when the kingdom of God ultimately. You see, our opportunity is to get saved now. Once the age of the church has finished, the, Jew, the, the Gentiles have got to be good to the Jews for at least three and a half years. So, we have 20 wonderful letters. And um, if you do know them, that's fine. You don't have to know them. But I want to show you a perfect order. If you go to Proverbs 31 with one finger, because I'm sure you've all bought more than one with you. Yeah. Ladies, tomorrow we are going to be in heaven, okay, all day. We are actually going to go through and we're going to identify every one of these Hebrew letters in the 22 verses. Because in Proverbs 31, from verses 10 to 31, you've got 22 Hebrew letters. It's called a perfect acrostic poem. An acrostic is putting something over uh, using words. And what we're saying here is this woman is actually the bride of Christ. Now, you've got, we are the Lamb's bride, but the bride of Jehovah has to come in. 
So this is where it gets very, very exciting. So we have got, first of all, in Proverbs 31, from 1 to 9, we have got the words of Lemuel. So we have got a, look at the first verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. Now, when you study this, the fact that it's got an L on the end, Torah readers and certain people in Madrash say L is Elohim, is looking for a wife. So you've got the description of the man in the first nine verses, but you've got the description of the woman, which we're going to look at tomorrow, ladies, in the next 22 verses. 22. Light making manifest. Ultimately, he's talking about, yes, the lamb's wife, but the bride of Jehovah. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that it starts looking verse 10, and that's the Aleph, and it finishes in 31, which is the Tav. Now, this is an acrostic poem, which means this is a picture language in Hebrew. He's showing you a picture. Of, now, let me quickly show you. A picture of a woman who knows who her ox is, who knows where her strength is, who knows who her leader is. But this woman... The second letter is bet, and it's a house. But can you see the house she has to go through an entrance because she's actually in that part there. She can only come in if the man brings her in. The third one is the foot, the gimel. But the foot and um, the gimel is later on become a camel because we've got the ancient and the modern here, which we'll be looking at tomorrow. How did... Isaac find his wife, she's coming to him on a camel. And the next one we find, he's bringing her to his tent door, the Dalet, the door, the pathway. What did Sarai have to become Sarah? Breath. She received breath. That, do you know what it means? Behold, I've seen a sight so beautiful. That's what it means. Behold, it means breath, but it means you only li you lift your hand in praise because you've seen a sight worth seeing. She's had the revelation, you're going to have a son. And his name is going to be Isaac. Laughter is going to be born from your womb. And he gives the same hey. Hey, isn't that lovely? I mean, we're doing it in great detail tomorrow, ladies. I'm just quickly going through it. And then... Really, everything there. You see, you've got, a, you've got a woman in a tent, ladies. She's been brought there by the camel. Something unclean's brought her there. She's found the door. She's received the sight. And breath has entered in. And now she knows who the tent peg is. The tent peg is the Vav, the golden tent peg in Zechariah. And what in Judges? Judges speaks of the second coming of Christ. And in the second coming of Christ, there's that, uh, with Deborah, there's Sisera. And what has to happen to Sisera? He has to go to the woman in the tent. Stay where you belong. You see, God had to show that the only hope of resurrection is with a barren woman in a tent. You see, the Jewish woman looks barren today. And she isn't going to give birth until she's prayed the prayer of Isaiah 53. And then she becomes the woman of fertility in Isaiah 54. Isn't, isn't that wonderful? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? And we could go on. You see, because here is the seventh letter. And she takes up her weapon. But anyway, does anybody think this is sexist? This is the woman. This is the man. This is the bride. But then the Lord showed me something else, completely by accident, as if Psalm 111. Now, I was ecstatic, wasn't I, Alec? I'm much more ecstatic than I should be all the time. I didn't know this, did you? Do you know all this? Okay. So the woman is described, and you know what it says? It takes the whole of the alphabet to describe the bride of Christ. It takes the whole of the alphabet for her to start with the ox, the beast of burden, and finish with his signature, and his signature is the cross. It takes the whole alphabet. But that wouldn't be fair then, would it, if... That would, that's just the beginning. And I didn't know. 
I didn't, did I? And I, I, I've done this with Alec all week, which is why I'm doing it exactly, because Alec has so loved it that we said, oh, i tell you what, we'll do it on Friday night because this is to do with the end times. You'll wonder how, but in a minute you'll see. Psalm 111, folks, is an acrostic psalm. It has 10 lines, but guess what it has? This is wonderful. It has 22 Hebrew letters from Aleph to, to Tav in stitches. They've called it stitches. They've used lines. And I've got a picture of it here. You're going to take it. You can take the notes home and it show you all the symbols. So Psalm 111 is about the Lord praise for his goodness. Amen. Now, there's 22 Hebrew letters because this is the one who's just finished in Psalm 110. He's become Melchizedek. He's come, look in verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. He has come at the end of the tribulation for the Jew. And they're saying, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And what does he say? You're no longer on a cross. The Lord is at thy right hand. What's he going to do, folks? Verse 5, he will shatter kings. In the day of his wrath, what will he do? He will judge among the nations. And what's he going to do with the Caliphites who have just gone out before the runners go? He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. Do you know what it means? It says, he shall wound the heads over many countries. What does that mean? He shall wound the head, surely, over Russia. He shall wound the head over Iran. It's your womb, the head. Did you know, um, you know, in the front of Bill Randall's book, he's saying that um, Sheba is Yemen. Sheba is Yemen. Look what's happening in Yemen. These child brides, this female mutilation. Yemen. Oh, didn't she have a long way to come to get to Solomon? And don't those dear child brides have a long way to come to get to Solomon? To get to Solomon. That's what we're living in. That's the reality of why we've been chosen. Not just about our... And do you find this marvellous? Yeah. We've got 22 to describe the woman because she's so beautiful. But we've got 22 to describe the Lord because he's now the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. Because it's the first hallelujah. See that word there? Praise the Lord in your margin. It goes, hallelujah. This is all in your notes. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright. That's you and me. We are the company of the upright. Amen. And we'll always be upright. We'll always be upright because, hey, we've seen a great sight. The breath has entered in. I'm no longer a frizzled, barren old woman. The breath has entered in. The breath of Christ has entered into us. And we beheld a great sight. And we're empowered to give birth to a child. And we're never a physical child. But we're empowered. When somebody can say, you are wearing the soul winner's crown, I've given birth to spiritual children. And only someone who's barren knows the pain. It gets better. Does anybody want to go home? Turn the page over. Sorry? Same. Turn the page over to 112. Guess what this is? It's another hallelujah. Look, this, Psalm 112, is the prosperity of the one who fears the Lord are those who are in the millennium. And guess what? There's 10 verses and there's 22 Hebrew letters. A perfect across the whole Hebrew alphabet is there explaining how wonderful Melchizedek is, the man who comes with the bread and wine after the first battle in Genesis 14, is being described here, Psalm 111. Psalm 111 is the Lord, but Psalm 112 is the people who are going to be joined to the Lord. Does that make you feel wonderful? So in the first verse, there's Aleph and Bet. In the second verse, there's Gimel and Dalet. In the third verse, there's Hay and Vav. I've written it all down. You can do it later. Okay? But then you see uh, how wonderful this is because you go then to Psalm 113 
And the Lord has sent the letters out. Amen. And he's starting to exalt the humble because he's actually... Look at Psalm 112, verse 9. The result of Jesus being Melchizedek that comes from the Valley of Peace. Look what he's done. 112, verse 9. Read it with me, please. He has given freely to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. Isn't this wonderful? Do you see the order? Well, they can't stop praising the Lord because then you get to Psalm 113. And now it's saying, he's come and he's delivered Israel. And it starts again. Hallelujah. That's you look where it says praise the Lord. The Hebrew word is hallelujah. It's in your margin. Read it with me, please. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name the Lord from this time forth and how long? No longer for seven years. No longer for a thousand years. Because at the end of the thousand years, which is what we'll be doing on Patmos, the new Jerusalem is coming down. And then this is what the people that have come into the kingdom are saying, verse 3. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And if you're in any doubt, go to verse 4. The Lord is high above how many? All nations. Iran, Iraq. Saudi Arabia, Russia, those who want to wipe Israel off the face. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord is high above all nations, Philip Hammond, isn't it? His glory is above the heavens. And this is Israel, who is like the Lord our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. And then look at the prophecy. Who gave the prophecy? He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Who are the princes of his people? Israel. It's Israel. The princes of his people are Israel. He says, Gentiles, come. You've been good to this nation. The letters are coming out. Come and join in the thousand-year reign. And then look what he says, verse 9. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. This is a double hallelujah. You see? Hallelujah, 111. Hallelujah, 112. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 113. Well, who said this? It was Hannah. Hannah, in a time of a corrupt priesthood, just turned to Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 2. I know it's really time to go. Now, is here anybody? is Hannah. She's in the day of a corrupt priesthood. Are we in the day of a corrupt priesthood? Is everybody lining up to say, man should marry man? I, I'm fed by, uh, these people who put these things on Facebook. I have seen more acts of sodomy on my <laughs> Oh, dear. And people, young people, are going to think this is normal. And it is the most degrading act upon the earth, isn't it? And it isn't homosexuality that brings down the nation. It's lack of restraining homosexuality that brought down the Roman Empire. Do you know Gibbon knew that the early church were pre-millennial? He hasn't gone so far as to say pre-tribulation. Gibbon knew who, who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire that all the early church were pre-millennialists. And then we've got all these scholars and doctors and the... I don't mean anything disrespectful like that. I mean scholars and doctors in the word. And, you know, and they're, they're soliloquizing and thinking, I'm not a premillennialist. Some people think, well, look at Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a millennialist. These are the mysteries, aren't they, of the Lord? But I believe God's revealing something wonderful to us tonight. So here's Hannah. She's crying out. She's a barren woman, and she wants a son. And her son Samuel was born, and he says he opened the church doors, didn't he? Just turn your page for 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 15. Look at this. Look at this. Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. It's a type of the remnant. But it took a woman to cry out for a son who would open the door of the Lord. Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. She was a prophet. Hannah was a prophet. And look what she said. Verse 8. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles. Now, in the AV, it says this. 
She raised them out of the dunghill that he might set them with princes, even with the princes of his people. She saw the nation of Israel at the end of the age and the Messiah being held as king and priest Melchizedek and sending out the letters. She saw it. She saw it. Oh, hallelujah, she saw it. Deep within her heart, she heard from God and she saw it. And you and I live here and we can hardly make it. I don't know whether I'll go to church on Sunday. You know, it's true, isn't it? The Lord says, you're my chosen people for this day. Now, let's just go back to finish. I know it's 10 to 10. Psalm 114. You go, is it still only 2015, Julie? Are we still in the same year? Or have we progressed to the millennial reign of the Lord? I feel him. I feel him in my heart. Do you feel him? You feel him, you know him, you love him, you can see him. I'm marking the perfect man. I'm watching him. I'm watching him with all my heart. Now, have a look at the perfect order. When you get to Psalm 113, so you've got Psalm 112 homework to go and put your Aleph bets, and Psalm 111, okay. And um, so there's a picture here on here. Oh, there you go. It's all there, okay? It's for you scholars to go home and have a look and say, Lord, Lord, how wonderful you are. Then they begin to get retrospective. This is, Psalm 114 is retrospective. And they say, when Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, so they are now coming back and thinking of their first deliverance that the Lord gave to them. And um, when you get to Psalm 115, they begin to compare the heathen idols with the Lord. Now, look what the nations are saying to Israel today in verse 2. Is everybody with me? Psalm 115, verse 2. Would you agree? Why should the nations say to Israel, where now is their God? Would you say that's what they're saying today? Well, where is the God of Israel? What is God going to do with them? Isn't, isn't that true? They've been scattered. Now, you turn the page over and you get to Psalm 116. Yeah, again. And the redeemed of Israel are saying, thank you. Look what they're saying about the, about the tribulation in verse 3. The cords of death encompass me. You see, they're going to all, two-thirds are going to die. And the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. But look at the answer. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, the Jews will say, I beseech thee. And what do they say? Save Save my my life. life. You are the Messiah. And look what he says. Verse 9. I shall walk before the Lord. Where? Where? In the millennial reign, in the land of the living. It says that in verse 9. Look at verse 10. I believed when I said, look, I believed when I said, this is Israel, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all men are liars. We have been assured the last couple of days that this is a move for mankind that no longer will Iran be fiddling around with the plutonium, but now they are being monitored. All men are liars. It's going to be said by Israel. Follow the order. They're in the millennium now. They knew that everybody lied. They get to Psalm 117. You see, Psalm 117 is one of the shortest psalms. And it's actually because the whole earth is in the millennium. Praise the Lord. How many nations? Are you following it? Are you following it? Praise the Lord. All nations. Lord him. You don't hear that word, do you, very often? Lord him. Oh, hallelujah. Lord him. Praise him. Give thanks to him. Get excited about him. Lord him. All peoples. All peoples. Why? For his loving kindness is great towards us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's why we come to church. That's why we get here. And it doesn't matter what plan or activity or anything you are planning in your life. It isn't going to come 
to pass. Because what is coming to pass is the will of God in your life to squeeze you, to fit you, to frame you. He devised a plan for your life. We are very vital to him. Psalm 118, again, they are celebrating. And this is the psalm, remember, verse 14 of Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength, says Israel, and song, and he has become my... Israel's got to get saved. My salvation. And then, look, they do. A third of them get saved. Verse 15, the sound of what? Joyful shouting. And salvation is where? In the tents of the righteous. Well, it's in the tent that you've got the nail to put through the head of Sisera. And the, oh, I know, because you know something, ladies? Tomorrow, when we get to Proverbs 31, and it says, and her hand held the distaff is actually the word there. It's, I think it's for car, where it says palm, arm, hand. It says her hand holds the distaff. And then she opens her hands. And, and in the two verses, it speaks of hands. That symbol's there. And I think, Lord, you have made these things easy. You have made these things wonderful. You are giving us a description of what we should be. And you are using a perfect language. Now, we're nearly finishing. This is the psalm, right? When you go down to verse 26 of 118, blessed is the one who's going to say this. This is not the believer saying this. This is Israel. Blessed Baruch Abar Bashem Adonai. Adonai, blessed is the one who comes in the name of Adonai. We have blessed you from the house of of the Lord. He is Jesus. The Lord, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, is Elohim. And he has given us light, okay? Bind the sacrifice. The festival sacrifice was Christ with cords to the horns of the altar. And because he died at the altar, look at Psalm 119. It's the acrostic psalm with 22 letters in it. Once Jesus has been offered on the altar, you need a pure language to explain what's coming upon the earth. 22. So you've got now 22 letters in Psalm 119. And how many verses in each letter? Eight. Eight. You see, they bound him to the cords of the altar. But he was resurrected out of the altar. That's what Psalm 119 is. That's what it's saying. Uh, uh, Aleph, 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 Bet, 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 Eight, 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 Eight. And then some people say, I don't understand it. Well, study, study till you sweat. Study till your heart just gets excited. He's reinforcing strength, leader, shepherd, tent. Vav, cross. That's what he's doing. So look. Now, look at this, Rodney. Uh, you always look at me like I've mystified you. It isn't until you've got the whole picture of the Hebrew language that describes the woman that you get the song of ascent. And I noticed this when Alec was speaking the other Sunday. Look at this, ladies, gents. Psalm 120, verse 1. Follows Psalm 119. After he's been bound, Baruch, Abar, Bashem, Adonai. But you see, because he'd been bound to the altar, he will come back as a saviour, a messiah. But look, you get the song of ascents after you get. Psalm 120 follows, yes, 190. 22 Hebrew letters. And then he says, in my trouble, says Israel, I cried to the Lord. And what did he do? He answered me. You do not get the psalm of ascents until... The pure language has been given in all those verses. And God spoke some of it to me tonight through you. But I want to carry on just one minute. You see, look where the Psalm of Ascent finishes. It's Psalm 134, folks. And this gets even better. Because the, the oil is flowing down Aaron's beard. Who is Aaron? He wore a blue robe. And he says... Yeah, he's a type of Christ who brought heaven down with him. And it says that nobody could cut. He says he had a wove. He says he wore blue with an opening that could not be torn. The cloak of Christ could not be torn. And he brings heaven down to earth. 
And he says, there's, there's oil flowing from me for you every day. The fact when you keep turning up exactly the same, just as miserable, just as people arguing, people ringing who aren't here today but are busy all week talking about us, knocking Zarapeth, various things. They don't know that heaven's been open for them. I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. I would not. I don't rubbish anybody in this church, and I never have. I don't pick a phone up and speak about people in here. It isn't just me they're speaking about. I marvel at their lack of fear. I marvel that they're not afraid. God sent Christ for me, for you, for the world. We are his representatives. We have a pure language. He's my leader, he's my oxen, he's my strength, he's my signature of the cross. Oh, by the way, doesn't she irritate? Yeah, that isn't the signature of the cross. That isn't the yoke. That isn't the miserable wife in the house. I wasn't miserable. I wasn't. I've lost the loss. But I tried to live according to Mark in the perfect man. I can honestly say in my life I've not found many doing that. Would you agree? Because it's so easy to go back in the flesh. It's so easy. Like I said the other week, everyone's looking for a massive deliverance ministry. Oh, it happened. The festival sacrifice was bound to the horns of the altar. Then it took the longest psalm to explain the perfect language of salvation. The perfect language of the 22 letters. Just to finish, Psalm 133 says... It is like, verse 2, it is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even whose beard? Aaron's beard, type of Christ, coming down upon the... And you know what it means? It's the mouth. It's the pay of his robes. Coming down the mouth. What's Jesus saying to you through me? That's why the fruit at the door. It is like the Jew of Hermon coming down. Why? Because they've found him to be Lord and Saviour. He's come, answered the cry at the end of the tribulation. Coming down upon the mountains of where, folks? Would you agree? It's the millennial reign. For there, there upon this earth that has been polluted by every filthy merchant you can think of today. You're hooked on pornography, some of you, in this, in this church. That God loves you to deliver you. Loves you to deliver you. It's his earth. How dare they? How dare they? How dare they? But they do. And as Israel said, all men are liars. And I warn the people, to, you know, you've got a man last night in a car with his wife, 79 years of age, stabbed to death in road rage. You know why? Pornography gives you no respect for anybody or anything. It's a violent act. It will change your image. It will make you feel like scum. And then it will make you go back to the same thing. And I'm saying here, look into the word. Hold up this perfect law of liberty and say, coming down upon the mouth of his robes is like the Jew of Hermon. Coming down upon the mountains of Zion. There the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forever. Life forever, and the enemy says, just before you get that life forever, I will pollute you that you won't, you hate yourself and you won't dare come to a clean God. You feel filth. That's what he's saying. I've come. He says, I've come with the refiner's fire. I've come with the laundry soap. I've come to wash you so clean. You'll always be clean before me. Hallelujah. This is the word of the Lord. Now, because the oil's come down Aaron's beard and he's been proclaimed in Psalm 119 because he's gone to the sacrifice in the altar, look what it says. This is the last song of his sent, 134. Behold, bless the Lord, all servants of the Lord who serve by night in the house. This is us for a thousand years. We're serving in the house. Who serve by night in the house of the Lord? Lift up your hands. Oh, I'm not lifting my hands up. Not ready to lift my hands up yet. Well, when are you ever going to do it, folks? When are you ever going to worship? It's very true. You know what that says? Sorry, Lord. I love you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I exhort you. I put myself to death in your company, and I love you. Whatever I, my heart is wondering on... I love you all. I love you. 
I was filthy, you're the ants, I love you. Yeah. You are the only piece Absolutely. You, you, you found me bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road. Father, you poured in the oil and the wine and I raised my hands. God wants men to lift up holy hands in prayer. I don't know what some people are waiting for. He's here. You serve by night in the house. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. He who made heaven and earth. Let me say something to you. Satan never made anything. Put Satan in a room and he could create nothing but chaos. He can create nothing. Satan can only counterfeit. He sees you made in the image of God and he goes, ha ha, how can I destroy you? I'll destroy you from within. I will destroy you. That's what the enemy does. He can't kill you, so he's got to steal off you. He, he's going to make you feel so filthy you can't come before the Lord. He, very true. Now, have a look here. Zephaniah 3, verse 8 and 9. We finish here. Now, Zephaniah is the great, great grandson of Hezekiah. Hezekiah. He Hezekiah was so ill, he asked for the figs. He asked for the figs to be laid upon his boil. What's a fig? The sweetness of the fig is the resurrection of Christ. And as the figs were laid upon Hezekiah, he says the clock went back ten paces. The law went from him because he received the sweetness of the fig of resurrection. The word fig means rehabilitation. He received the ministry of the sweet fig, meaning he needed something outside of himself to be laid upon his boil. And he lived another 15 years. Oh, hallelujah. But he had a great, great, great grandson called Zephaniah. So I'm thinking... Well, what, is he, what does Zephaniah, what does his name mean? And I wrote it down somewhere so good that I can't find it. So I'm going to have a look on here. You see, I, I get so carried away when I do these things that I forget where I'm meant to be. Here we go. Uh, Zephaniah. Let me see if I've got it. Here we go. Oh, I want you to get this. Have you ever seen anything like this, Helena? I'm sure not, no. I'm sure not. I'm sure I don't do it right. I'm absolutely sure I'm not doing this right. But I do know something. I could be the most dried, bitter old stick you've ever found in your life. I had a really horrible day yesterday. So much never to get up again. And I mean it. And all I can say is that somehow Christ is alive in me. That's all I can say. Because you see... Some people think you're just beating the air and seeing things that aren't there. Why is Zephaniah's name right at the end of the age? The man who'd received the sweetness of the fig was his great, great, great grandfather. Zephaniah means Jehovah hides. Jehovah hides. Who's he going to hide at the end of the age? He's going to hide the Jews in Petra. Right. This, this, see if this doesn't look at this verse 8 this is Israel today there woe to Jerusalem and the nations says Zephaniah 3 therefore this is God speaking through Zephaniah saying Jehovah hides there's coming a day you know where they'll come for us Amen. they will come for us we will be the remnant waiting We'll be the church. They'll send them, those people who have found fault with us. They'll say. Verse 8. Therefore, wait for me. Amen. Capital M. Declares the Lord. For the day when I rise up to this prey. In, he's drawing the prey, you see. He's drawing the prey for the executioners. Do you see this? Indeed, my decision is to gather nations. They're coming. Iran is coming. Iraq is coming. Syria will come. To assemble kingdoms. To pour out on them my indignation. All my burning anger for all the earth. Read it. Will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. And I want to say something. There are 22 Hebrew letters in that verse. It's a perfect acrostic. Isn't that amazing? 22 
letters in that verse are going to lead you to the final verse this night. But look what he's saying. The 22 pure language Hebrew letters are saying, I, it is my decision to gather the nations, to assemble the kingdoms, to pour out my indignation. I'm going to cleanse the earth of all that filth. You can't sit anymore on a PC. You can't sit there because they're watching you and they're coming to get you. There isn't a big will to deal with paedophilia, necromancers that they want to make. They want to reduce the age of consent. There's certain people who want. It's true. It's true. My darling, verse 9. This is, this is where we've all gone tonight. For then, after the Hebrew 22 letters in verse 8, what do you read in verse 9? For then I will give to the people purified lips. In one translation it says, you will have a pure language. This language. Which is the same word Alec is saying was lips in Psalm 34. That all of them is going to purify the lips and give you a pure language that before it described his bride, then it describes the Messiah after he's become the priest, then it describes his people, and then after he's gone to the altar to be bound so that the people can say in the end, Baruch Abba, Bashem Adonai. Then they give the pure language and then that sum of ascent is for us all. We're all going up. But better than this, you see, we're not, not just going up. We're coming down to go up. We'll have already gone to heaven to come up. We'll have gone to heaven to come back down. And we will come up and down Jacob's ladder and we will go up with them. But we will see the nations that have looked after the Jew for three and a half years. We will see them be gathered at the sheep and goat nation. So we finish this. I love this, that all of them, you see, you've been given this pure language, it says here, that purify your lips, that all of them, all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, I'm not going into that. When you go to verse 9, look what it says. Shoulder to shoulder means with one shoulder so, uh, Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, the government shall be upon his shoulder during the thousand year reign. And we're going to be speaking somehow a perfect language. Now, we are going home and we don't want to go, do we? Because it's so wonderful. Um, but there are these notes if you want to take them with you. If you want to look at it, work through it. Ladies, tomorrow we're trawling through the whole 22 Hebrew letters.